we're, let's enter the Q and A portion of this. I'm going to moderate uh, the questions that have been asked on Pigeonhole, roughly just going uh, in order of of number of votes. So if you haven't voted or if you haven't uh, asked your question, get that in there uh, sooner rather than later. Um, let's start out with a with a question for Iyad. So. Uh, the question is, do either or both, potentially your, the first two projects you presented, have any implications for contact tracing during a pandemic? Certainly a topically relevant question, uh, or a temporarily relevant. Yeah, that's, that's a good question. Um, as it happens, actually, my collaborator on these uh, two projects wrote one of the very first contact tracing papers uh, back in 2014, I think. Um, I do think that they, uh, they are relevant in the sense that um, they, uh, you could potentially use incentive schemes that encourage uh, recruitment for not just installing an app for contact tracing, but also for recruiting others, uh, both to install the app, but also perhaps to share uh, their data uh, with, uh, with other people and perhaps to create some sort of social reward system that keeps people sort of motivated to keep doing this. Um, so I, I haven't thought of, about the details, but I think it's a, it's a really nice idea. So whoever asks that question should definitely do it. Great. Um, all right, so the next question is for Tom. Uh, what are the main challenges that in your mind need to be addressed uh, to harness the full potential of collective intelligence? So that's a sur cer certainly a big question. In some <laughs> sense, you could say this whole conference is the answer to that question. Uh, I guess maybe the question is asking just for my personal opinions about what are some of the most important things or some of the most promising things. Yeah. I think uh, part of what, in some sense, inspired this whole conference series is the idea that while well, collective intelligence in many forms involving humans and other biological entities and so forth, while it's existed for for millennia, in some sense almost forever, uh, I think the new technologies we have, especially for communication and also in many cases for computation, those new technologies are enabling some really new kinds of collective intelligence to be feasible and often very powerful. So I think that's one of the most interesting things from my point of view is how these new technologies can enable new kinds of collective intelligence that were never possible before. Uh, another thing I would point to as one that I think is often hard to get right and that we often overlook is incentives. It's pretty easy to think of new kinds of collective intelligence that would be cool and sure people maybe could do them, but uh, motivating people to do them is often a much harder question. So I think that's a pretty important thing too. So there's many other things we could say, but those are at least two starters of things that I think are important. Great, <laughs> thank you. And, and yeah, it always makes me think, you know, in your discussion of uh, incentives in this kind of digital WPA, you know, incentives always have this dual nature. It's, it's incentivizing, but it's also uh, rewarding you know, that effort and contribution. So it's kind of fair pay for, for work, um, uh, whether that's, you know, for-profit work or, or just contributions in the types we saw in all the presentations. Um, so for, for Lisa now, uh, there was a question about in your studies, will you consider um, things like body language and eye contact and other kinds of nonverbal uh, communication in, in how you're thinking about this team performance? Yes, we are. Um, though this area is falling with um, some of my engineering collaborators. So for example, um, they're working on measuring body movements so that they can estimate eye gaze and also um, overall body movements during some of our tasks and some of our um, tasks actually involve physical movements. And so we can um, study both um, vocal contributions and physical contributions to the teamwork. Awesome, sounds really exciting. Um, Okay, back to Iyad for a second. Your next question is, uh, is again, you know, you're <laughs> hitting on uh, very, very temporally relevant issues. Um, so did you have a particular strategy for dealing with misinformation in the studies that you talked about? Uh, unfortunately, there was nothing uh, really systematic. Uh, it was, um, so all of these challenges were fairly time critical. So. Uh, 
there was like a deadline and we had to move fast. Um, and you know, it, it already was, uh, I think, an accomplishment to be able to build the systems in time to do these things. So uh, we didn't, we couldn't really anticipate all of the possible ways in which people could attack the system. So I would say there was much more ad hoc uh, reactions. So blocking things, stopping people from from entering the system, from new signups. Uh, I mean, for the Shredder challenge, it took us two years to actually find the you know how exactly the attack happened and whether you could have detected the, uh, like the signature of the attack earlier um, you know until it took us a while to analyze the data so i think in retrospect uh, one can now go back and use some of these uh, findings from the papers uh, to introduce some of these um, uh, early detection approaches i think it's something that lo long running projects like wikipedia for example are very good at because they've had time to adapt but in a time critical project um, of this nature, I think it's it's much harder. So you use like whiteboards to corroborate numbers or things like that, uh, much more low tech. It sounds like a, a compelling open problem, <laughs> but great. Uh, let's see, we have time for a couple more questions. I'm gonna go back to Lisa. Um, so there's this question about did the reduction in, or is the reduction in variance between individuals and teams uh, result of there being fewer teams. So you're kind of grouping people into sets. Does that uh, imbalance play a role in what you what you observed? So I, I think maybe there is a little confusion. So the boxes that were comparing the initial solutions and the um, the um, final outcomes for um, the team, the individuals that were in teams, were only in um, including one individual per team. So it was either um, the median individual for the first one I showed or um, the best individual in the second one I showed. So um, both those boxes contain the same number of points. Great, okay. So that was controlled for, that sounds great. Um, let's see if anything else has been re-ranked here. Um, so, I'm trying to see if there's some intersection between some of these questions uh, uh, and maybe make it a more open-ended question to the panel here. Um, so there's a, a number of uh, the, the later questions that ask about how uh, interactions or incentives uh, can be used to, um, to kind of guide crowds and, and collective processes, um, as well as some of the, the capabilities. I wonder if there's anything that the, any of the three speakers uh, wanted to add about maybe some of the, the intersections you see between your own talks and where either these guidance mechanisms or um, the, the capabilities uh, overlap. And if you wanted to add anything there before we, before we go to the first break. I'll let anyone just jump in. So <laughs> this is the more traditional panel. We'll see if we can do this online. Well, if you want, I'll, I'll add lib something. I see one of the questions is about how, whether crowd and collective intelligence can filter out fake news. Um, uh, uh, that's a question I've thought about. And I think the answer depends on what you mean by fake news. Um, if by fake, you mean things that uh, most people in a community think is wrong, then crowds can absolutely do that. Uh, the problem is almost everything we believe is real is based on what other people we respect tell us is real and true. You know, is George Washington the first president of the United States? Well, we believe it because lots of people we trust said it uh, ever since we were little. Uh, but in fact, there actually is some debate about how you would define the term president, of the, you know, first president of the United States, and there's someone else, John something or other, who has a claim to it also. Uh, so I think if uh, a problem, and in fact, it is a problem with what we're talking about as fake news, is that when a broad community becomes segmented into smaller sub-communities, who have very different ideas about what's true in the first place. Those communities can do a good job of filtering out fake news from the point of view of each community. But if you don't even trust the other community's views about what's fake, 
then they probably can't do a good job of filtering out what you think is fake. Right. Yeah, that becomes a tricky problem. And and we're we're out of time. We need to go to the the break here. But just to kind of add a little bit of connection there, you know, I wonder how Lisa, your work on teams intersects with these types of issues when uh, we're all broken up into little community working groups that are more localized. And now the people I bump into in the in the hallway is this very small set of people who might not agree with the office on uh, two blocks over. <laughs> so do we get more fracture? Uh, or is that kind of alleviating because we're not doing the same type of um, naturalistic grouping? Oh yeah, no, that's a that's a great question. Um, I think just studying how this situation as a whole is impacting these dynamics is just a whole another research area. Um, I saw one of the questions was related to um, how do like virtual interactions affect some of these interaction processes, and that's kind of another aspect of all of this um, that we're definitely thinking about right now. Um, so we don't have answers to that question, but we're definitely thinking about um, ways that we can kind of expand on these topics in the future. Very cool. All right. Yeah. So uh, thanks again to all the speakers uh, in this session. We are going to try out this uh, Mingler tool for the upcoming break here. Um, Chris, did you have any other announcements before we launch into that about the mechanics? Maybe, maybe not. Maybe if we um, could share the link to the Mingler. Yeah, I was going to say, Tom, do we have the information? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Share? Uh, I actually have had two announcements I'm supposed to make now. One is about Mingler, but the other one is about another topic. Uh, let's see. Are you seeing my screen shared yet? We are, yeah. Um, OK, so actually, I was. Uh, it gave away the punchlines for this first slide because if you saw it before I put it as full screen. Um, but uh, the first announcement I have to make is about the uh, conference chair and vocation for Collective Intelligence 2021. I'm happy to announce that Torben Jewell Anderson will be the conference chair for next year's Collective Intelligence Conference. It will be held in Copenhagen unless we're unable to do so for various reasons, in which case there will also be a virtual contingency plan. And the dates will be June 29th and 30th. So I very much hope to see all of you next year in Copenhagen or wherever for Collective Intelligence 2021. Uh, the other thing I want to do is tell you a little more about how to use Mingler starting in just a minute. Uh, uh, all you really need to do is go to the website mingler.info. So when you get to that website, there'll be things you can click on to, to uh, log in and use the system. You saw what it looked like uh, on my slide a few minutes ago. Remember that this is a beta test. Uh, we've only been working on this system for about six weeks. Uh, it's likely that some of you will have some problems getting it to work, uh, but we hope that many of you will have a chance to experience this new uh, uh, capability for ad hoc private conversations. Uh, one thing that would help to know is that the system works best with the Chrome browser, unless you're using iOS, in which case you should use Safari. Uh, and if you need technical help in the course of this, there is a link on the mingler.info page where you can get some technical help as well. So uh, here we go. Looking forward to seeing all of you in Mingler.